message is God's Triumphant Church. Don't forget that. God's Triumphant Church. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, if Jesus is going to give himself up for the church, shouldn't you and I do the same? Sure we should. Look what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Why do we pray in Jesus' name this morning? Why do we sing songs that lift up Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Why do we praise him? Why do we come together? We're not here promoting each other. We are here exalting the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we'll be coming back to this verse a little bit later, this passage. You will recognize it, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Bible warns us that in the end times that there will be a great falling away from the faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. In fact, it already may be happening. Why is this decline happening in the church? Well, there might be several reasons, not just one. One reason is we've made the mistake of being more focused on making converts than making disciples. Disciples understand that they are followers of Christ. They believe in Jesus. They belong to Jesus. They want to behave like Jesus. They want to treat the church like Jesus. Another mistake we've made is, is the fact that there are those that have been in the church, and it was easier to join the church in the day, uh, not just this church, but most churches in America. There was a time when it was easier to join a, a Baptist church than join the Boy Scouts. And so we find coming to a season where, as John said in his day, they went out from us because they were not of us. And then there's another reason. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, Paul said, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And yet, nevertheless, because too many who name the name of Christ and are members of local churches have ignored God's Word except for Sunday, and even then they don't bring their Bibles, they simply listen and read it off the screen, uh, because they don't spend time with God in prayer, because they don't meditate on the truths of His Word, the world comes in and squeezes them into the shape that conforms with the world around them rather than being transformed by the renewing of their mind by God's Word and God's Holy Spirit. What is the result? The result is they become more comfortable with what is unholy uh, and less comfortable with what is truly holy. There might be someone here that's struggling with that very thing themselves. You see, the abnormal for too many Christians which is a carnal lifestyle, has become normality for too many Christians. So, three things this morning. I know that surprises you, but three things in the study. You have your guide in front, hopefully. Number one, let's talk about the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church. Uh, what is it? Well, it is a community of those who believe in and belong to Jesus and are committed to following him. That's the church, a community of those who believe in and belong to Jesus and are committed to following him. As I'm accustomed to saying about our own church, that, that we are a local blood-bought body and bride of King Jesus. Now, the Baptist faith and message says this about the church. A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel. In other words, who is the foundation? What is the foundation of a church? It's Jesus. That's the real 
foundation of the church. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, no one can lay any other foundation than that which has been laid, that is, Jesus Christ. You see, a true church is one that has a steeple. A true church isn't one that has stained glass windows. A true church is one that has piano and organ or guitars and drums that has uh, sings from hymnals or sings from slides. Uh, a true church is any church that confesses that Jesus is God and Jesus is the head of that church, that he's the cornerstone, he's the owner, he's the chief shepherd, uh, the great shepherd, uh, he is the head of that church, and he is the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. Emmy Dodd wrote these words, the deity of Jesus his virgin birth, his vicarious atonement, his bodily resurrection, and his second coming are the component parts of this foundation. The church has a sure foundation, a safe foundation, a solid foundation, an enduring foundation, and an eternal foundation if its foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now some describe the beginning of the church as though it was nothing more than a group of people who... Uh, had things in common. They liked the same stories. They liked the same songs. Uh, they read the same verses of Scripture. And so they finally said, hey, let's get together. And after a while of meeting, they decided to call themselves a church. My friend, that is a silly idea, but it is repeated by more than you might suspect. And those that repeat that idea have this in common. They hate the church. And they want to destroy it, but they can't. Why? Because the church is not an invention of men and women. The church was divinely created by God. Now, we have a wonderful insight into what the church is about. If you'll take your Bibles and turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, we read from Chapter 16, just a moment ago, I want to read in context. Jesus is about two years, two and a half years maybe, into his ministry. He is at Caesarea Philippi, a beautiful river and stream. If you've ever been with me to Israel, then this is always one of the high points that we look forward to going. And when we return to Israel, we'll go there again. This passage of Scripture comes from there at Caesarea Philippi, where that wonderful, clear stream of water flows out from, under, from the mountain and provides water for so much of the nation. And so there Jesus, he came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or as one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, that's a good question. Your salvation depends upon the answer that you give. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, then we come to point number two, the congregation of the church. Now, some people refer to the congregation as the crowd, just those who show up for a service. That's not what I'm describing. That's not what the scriptures are describing. The church body is made up of members where each member, his and her, they know their place and they have at least one spiritual gift to help the body function as it should. Now, what is, what is the Greek word, you should know this, that describes the church in the Bible? It's ecclesia. Say ecclesia. That's pretty good. The Greek word ekklesia is the primary New Testament word for church. And it means the ones who have been called out. The called out ones who are the visible demonstration of what a true congregation, 
a local body and bride of Jesus should look like and how it should live. The Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23, 24, and 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, the Bible says, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. You know, it's hard to encourage someone if you're not around them. It's hard to be a blessing to someone if you don't see them. There is the ministry of presence. I know. I was talking to somebody just a minute ago before the service began. Uh, is it something that when we were young and felt good, how we just took it for granted? We just thought we'll feel this way all the time. And now, boy, if you have a day that's pretty good, isn't it grand? Isn't it grand you got a pretty good day? Now, most of us here had to fight an ache or a pain or a sniffle or a sneeze or something that we could have said, well, let's just not go today. After all, I don't want to put anyone to risk. Boy, have we heard that a lot since COVID pandemic. In fact, the Barna Research Group has done a study, and just as of two years ago, one in three practicing Christians in America dropped out entirely during the pandemic. And as I talk to pastors all over this nation, just like where we are, it seems that many have yet to come back to their church family. We need to come back to church and not forsake the ministry of presence. When we're not here, then that's one less person to pray with that church family. That's one less person to encourage somebody else. One less person to, to praise the Lord. And should we say, as Baptists, if we don't come, one less person to give in support of the ministry that God has entrusted to us. Did you know that studies show that going to church is actually good for your health? Now think about that. Going to church is good for your health. Uh, now, there are those who say, well, I'm going to be spiritual but not religious. I don't need the church. Well, guess what? You're a body, soul, and spirit. You're spiritual whether you want to be or not. But the expression of your spirituality is the necessity of you if you confess Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, to be in community and connection with a local Bible-believing, blood-bought church. Surveys and research shows that 29%, there is a 29% reduced risk of depression for those who attend versus those who never attend. 33% reduction in the risk of death a 33% reduction in the risk of adolescent uh, uh, illegal drug use, a 50% reduction of the risk of divorce, an 84% reduction in the risk of suicide. And so the growing American challenge by, in our nation is that, hey, it's okay to identify as spiritual but not religious. In other words, ignore the church. And yet research shows it could be detrimental to your health. If you do, if going to church is helpful to a healthy life, then let's ask ourselves the question, what makes up a healthy church? Isn't that important? What makes up a healthy church? Is it simply a crowd? Is it exceeding a budget? Is that what makes for a healthy church? Well, there are three words, I think, that are brought out in the Baptist Faith and Message Summary about church health and church life. And the first word is autonomy. Write down that word, autonomy. Now, just make sure you're awake. Say that word together with me, autonomy. I caught some of you off guard one more time, autonomy. Now, what does that mean? The Baptist Faith and Message identifies the local church, here it is, as an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers. That means every congregation, every local church family has the responsibility to carry out and to fulfill God's mission vision for that particular church independently of any human authority over it. In other words, and here's the phrase, no earthly headquarters can exert authority over the local church. There is no elder board outside of this congregation. There is no bishop's office 
somewhere that dictates to this church family how and when and where and why we perform and seek the ministry and mission that we do. But there's another word, and that word is lordship. Say lordship. Lordship. What does that mean in the context of the church? It means we stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ affirming Jesus' lordship over his church. Jesus doesn't serve his church. He seeks for his church to serve him. He is the resurrected, living, reigning king and Lord. He is to rule in the church. How does he do it? Through the ministry of God's living word and through the guiding of God's Holy Spirit. That's why the preaching and teaching of God's word is so important. Uh, that's why I had a group of brothers in Christ before this service laying hands on me, as is the custom before I come out and preach, knowing that we need to hear what God says. That's why the preaching and teaching of God's Word is so important. That's why the largest block of time that we allow in a worship service on Sunday morning is dedicated to opening up God's Word that we might understand it, that we might hear from the Lord. The Lordship of Christ is displayed even as we're organized, pastor-led, deacon-served, committee-organized, congregational-approved, all under the headship and the Lordship of Jesus. But there's one more word that we need to understand. Covenant. Say covenant. Covenant. This also describes a healthy church. It's the big difference between joining a church and joining the Kiwanis Club or any other voluntary organization. If you're a member of First Roanoke, then you are in covenant together with other believers for the purpose of fulfilling and carrying out the Great Commission. And the idea of covenant, which is a lot deeper than just a commitment, a lot deeper than simply taking a new member's next steps class. This is a personal vow, a covenant relationship. It should not uh, be broken easily or readily. In fact, when you read the New Testament, the only two reasons that the Apostle Paul ever gives for risking the peace and harmony of local church, the covenant of that local church, is to stand against immorality are to stand against heresy. Other than that, we protect the unity of God's people. We are bound together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's why the Baptist faith and message says this. The local church is a covenant community of believers who, united by common faith and a saving experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what binds us together willingly enter a covenant together to fulfill all the responsibilities and receive all the promises that God gives to his people. Along the California coastline are some of the largest living organisms on the planet, the redwood trees. They can be 40 feet around, 300 feet tall. Uh, they, can, they can live for 250 years or longer and what's interesting is these grove of giant trees in the northwest, they don't have a deep root system, but instead their roots are all intertwined. They're connected together. That's how they grow. That's how they withstand the storms, the wind. Uh, that's how they are able to exist. No connectedness, no growth. No long life. As we look at the declining church attendance in America, there's no surprise about the lack of connectedness for Christian growth and fellowship. What is it that we say we are connected in Christ? That brings us together. The phrase in Christ is what the Apostle Paul repeats over and over and over again in the New Testament. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember where you are spiritually. We are positioned, connected in Christ. Christ. And yet we live in a very self-focused culture. And maybe that's why so many Christians have such a hard time remembering to be loyal to the covenant of their fellowship and family of faith. 
Dear friends, remember, if you find a church that still is unafraid to preach the full counsel of God's Word, if you find a church that takes a stand, not just privately but publicly, for righteousness, for the sanctity of marriage, for the sanctity of life, regardless of what wokeism or humanism or atheism has to say about it in the society in which we live, you better anchor down and praise God because there are fewer and fewer churches like that in this world that you can be a part of. Well, then we need to close. I'm about out of time. There's the demonstration of the church. The demonstration of the church. Uh, that is the life and work of the church. It, it's not just what we do now. It's what we do when this service is over. It's what we do the rest of the week. Uh, J.M. Frost was the founding secretary of the Sunday School Board. That's what, you, that's what we call Lifeway now. He was the founding secretary of it in the convention. And he said, the church, like individual Christians, that is the salt of the earth. In fact, let me bring up that what he said on the slide, that it's the salt of the earth. It's the light of the world. It's a city that's set on a hill and cannot be hid and has the glorious privilege of letting its light so shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify God. And I will say amen. And that's how God demonstrates his purpose, his power, his person, his peace in his people called his church. That's why we say that our mission vision is we're connected in Christ to lead others to him by maximizing God's resources to accomplish the Great Commission together where? Locally and globally, whether it's across the street with Straight Street, down the street with Car Care, or across the ocean in Lesotho, Africa. We draw closer to Christ in the Christian life, and the evidence is we are more excited about doing what Jesus said we ought to do. And I want to tell you something. The world needs to see the power of the Holy Spirit today in more than a song service, in more than simply a prayer meeting, as good as those things are. It needs to see people filled and running over with the Holy Spirit who have been broken by their sin, who are living in the demonstration of true revival, where there is a love for God expressed by a love for His Word. Because as we take in the Word of God, then not only do our emotions uh, form in the right direction and are balanced and filtered in the right way by our faith, but we have the truth to stand upon to face the storms of life, to be the witnesses for Christ, and to be the church triumphant that Jesus says we are to be. But it all begins by you and I being desperately dependent upon him. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender. I surrender all. So the question is, God, how do you want to use me in your church this year? What about being an encourager? We have a desperately bent and perverse culture that continually tries to squeeze us into its mold. Friend, I want to tell you something. No matter what the woke world says, you have not accomplished anything good by being a critic. But you can do something good by being an encourager and telling people about what Jesus has done, not only in your church, but in your life. And then in humility and love, letting the world see him in you. Down there, not far where I went to school, there's a 137-mile-long river. I want to see if I can say it right. The Atchafalaya River. Boy, that's an Arleya. Atchafalaya River. 
it's a distributory stream, which means it, it, it comes off the Mississippi. And it's important, and a lot of farms and, and industries need and depend on this river. But it has no strength of its own. It rises and falls in its water flow based upon its water source, the Mississippi River. It's just an overflow of that river. Anything of value it ever accomplishes is always tied to the source. And isn't that true for you and me as a church? Anything we accomplish of value, it's tied to the source. It's not us, it's Jesus in us, through us, and if necessary, despite us. Rudyard Kipling was once called the laureate of the British Empire. One of his poems, published in 1896 was called Hymn Before Action. It was based on a hymn by Samuel John Stone, which was written almost 30 years earlier. You'll recognize the words to the hymn, some of you will. It's entitled, The Church's One Foundation. I think it is the right place for us to end this message on the doctrine of the church today. You listen or even repeat with me if you know it. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest this is the church we are by god's grace and for god's if you want to know more about what it means to have Jesus as your advocate, then call or contact us using the information on your screen. We want to help you to know and receive Jesus Christ today as your personal Lord and Savior. If you live in the Roanoke Valley but don't belong to a local church, then I would personally like to invite you to worship with us next week in person right here at First Roanoke. Our Sunday morning services are at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and our college and young adult service is at 6 p.m. May God bless you and your family today by His grace and for His glory.